Right, we'll uh, make a start, I think. Uh, welcome everyone uh, to this final, uh, final for the academic year uh, 2021, final uh, London Policing Seminar Series event uh, held jointly, hosted jointly by the Institute for Global City Policing and the Canterbury Centre for Policing Research. My name is Ben Bradford, I'm Director at the Institute for Global City Policing. Um, and, and this today we're talking about the, the interesting and surprisingly controversial topic um, of police recruitment training, uh, direct entry in, into, into, in our case, detectives and, and related issues. And um, we have three speakers or three sets of speakers, I should say. Um, I'll introduce them uh, one by one as they come online. Um, what I think we'll probably do today is take immediate questions uh, of clarification uh, and, and points of fact after each talk, and then we'll get reconvene the panelists when everyone's finished, which will probably be something about half past three um, for a wider Q&A session. Um, and we will certainly finish by four, if, if not earlier, if, if people run out of, of questions. Um, I should say this is being recorded. Um, so when I read out people's questions, I, I won't attach a name to the question, um, so we don't run into any difficulties um, with, with the dreaded GDPR. Um, and please use the Q&A function to ask your questions, not the chat function, the Q&A function, please. That's the one we'll be monitoring um, um, for questions. And obviously you can raise a question whenever you want. That's one of the benefits of doing this all on Zoom. So without any further ado, I'm going to hand over to our first speaker, who is Adrian James from Liverpool John Moores University. Um, he's going to be talking about an empirical evaluation um, of fast track recruitment schemes. I'm going to read out the title because it's a good one. To what extent can they achieve their architect's aim of a more diverse and capable detective force in Britain? So, Adrian, over to you. Uh, thanks, Ben, and uh, good afternoon, everybody. Um, can I just check you can hear me, first of all? Yeah, loud and clear. That's, that's great. Thanks very much. I, well, as Ben says, I want to talk about uh, some fast track schemes that I reviewed on behalf of... Um, the National Police Chiefs Council about 18 months ago now. <clears throat> in fact, the research is, is ongoing because uh, in January this year, I was asked to kind of revisit the schemes and see um, if, if early promise had been fulfilled, if early challenges had been overcome uh, and, and so on. So um, I'm very much gonna talk about the first phase of the research, which uh, ended at the end of 2019 um, with a report I submitted to, to MPCC about, about the four schemes that, that I looked at. And I think there's probably a few um, uh, notes of explanation that go along with that. What, uh, one was that um, I was asked to review fast track schemes, which are you know, very different to what, for instance, Steve and Martin have been researching um, a direct entry scheme, which the MET is, is operating. Uh, in, in all these the schemes I looked at, people actually do spend some time so they come in on a kind of accelerated pathway but they do get trained uh, as uniform cops so they they and they have to achieve that standard of safe and lawful before they go on and do their their their, their and their detective training and that in itself caused caused um, uh, as many uh, challenges and, and uh, as, as, as presented opportunities and i'll talk about that uh, in a moment so I should think it's germane to say something about myself, and that is I'm a reader in police studies at uh, John Moores, uh, and I was a detective for 25 years, although I, I left the police a long time ago, um, 2007, and it feels like sometimes when I'm talking about the police, that I'm talking about another world and, uh, and, and somebody else's life, but uh, there you go. And I hope that gives me um, a degree of objectivity um, that um, maybe is more difficult to achieve when, you, when you're immersed uh, in, in the environment. Um, the, so I just, sorry, so there was, there were three fast track schemes and then I also looked at um, something that was called a detective academy and this, and this essentially was a kind of traditional recruitment path, um, but with, 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 with um, added benefits, if you like, uh, and, and, and better marketing um, to encourage people to, to go into the, to the, to the detective force because um, you know, I think it's probably the motivation for all the schemes, including the Met's direct entry, is that the, the, the CID uh, or detective work is uh, not as attractive as, as it used to be, it, it, which of course goes against all the, the fictional representations you see of, of, of um, you know, the kind of uh, the glamour excitement of the, of, of the work, of course, is, um, you know, rarely the case uh, in real life and um, more, more and more 
um, as kind of uh, shift patterns are changed and extra benefits are given to officers working in a response role, um, you know, the balance has shifted so that uh, people are, uh, you know, drawn or uh, stay within uh, uh, on the uniform pathway and are not um, tempted to take on a detective role where they are uh, you know, kind of a cradle to grave responsibility for cases. And I think, um, uh, you know, and then just shift patterns and uh, support in terms of uh, family life um, are um, uh, more easily kind of uh, managed as a, as a uniform cop than they are as detective. And, and I know when I first was asked to uh, um, carry out this research, Nationally, the, 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 the police estimated they had 5,000 fewer detectives than, than they wanted, and that's a considerable number, as I'm sure you can understand. Um, and then, so there's three fast track schemes, and then the fourth was this detective academy. Um, and I'll try my best not to identify the forces. I've, I've, I've I call them A, B, C, and D, D being the uh, academy, A, B, and C being the fast track schemes. Um, so those schemes, so forces A, B, and C, the three fast track schemes were first announced in um, 2017. And it was hoped that they'd encourage um, greater diversity. So, so, so expand the, the, the pool, if you like, of, uh, 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 of uh, people who could be uh, attracted to, to policing. And also that um, people would have new skills or potentially um, have new skills um, that Officers, uniform officers traveling along traditional pathway into the CID hadn't, uh, didn't have or hadn't had the opportunity to, to achieve. Um, so it was, that was a proposal uh, made by National Police Chief Council, NPCC, um, um, to address what they consider to be a national crisis in detective numbers. And they weren't welcomed universally. Um, on, on social media, they attracted adverse comment on, almost from the beginning. Um, and the police federation argued, which is the uh, kind of police union, um, uh, or at least the closest thing the police have to, to, to a union, argued that they were the, the schemes were unnecessary and that existing PC to DC pathways were much more likely to create high quality in, investigators. Um, and some academics and colleagues argued that the plan has risked the employment of the wrong kind of investigator, the consumer capitalist detective with a sense of entitlement and a narcissistic streak, which um, is an interesting take on the, uh, on, on, on really what were quite modest plans, I, I feel, but, you know, we're all academics, we're all entitled to our view. Um, so the, the schemes I looked at were not, uh, they, weren't, they weren't the same, they weren't identical, but they shared many characteristics. Um, the, in each of those three schemes, recruits completed the initial police learning development program. And if you're in the police, you know, you'll be very familiar with these terms, IPLDP, uh, and then spent a truncated period of uniform and response role before sitting the national investigators exam, which people need to, to, to get to be considered to be a, um, a, a, a trained investigator, an accredited investigator. Uh, and then they, once they passed the exam, they enrolled on the uh, initial crime investigators program, the ICIDP, and then when they finished that, they got uh, PIP two professionalized investigation program, uh, stage two accreditation, um, and that meant they were uh, qualified detectives. So one force was further along than the other two, uh, um, and uh, 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 they they anticipated that their first graduates so the scheme. I'll just switch my phone off to apologize. Uh, would um, would graduate in, in, in November 2019, uh, in the second force, Force B, shortly after that, uh, and then the third force in April, which was a little further behind April 2020. So with, there are now, and this, again, I guess, is the point of going back and interviewing uh, um, recruits that have gone through the schemes, because there are no people who've been um, practicing as detectives for, for, for a year or, or, or more. And I guess I should say, and I should have maybe said at the outset that, um, these schemes have a limited shelf life, essentially because of um, the introduction of the police education and qualification framework um, and the uh, requirement that, uh, you, you know, there are only kind of th three avenues into policing now. Um, and the, the schemes as they are, were configured anyway, and as they are currently running in, in, the, in, in some forces in the country, um, 
you know, have to end uh, uh, um, soon. Uh, I'm, I'm not quite certain when the College of Policing has, 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 has set the cut-off date, but there is a date which these schemes have to end. I think it's a real shame, but I'll, I'll, again, I'll come back to that uh, later. Um, so the research largely was qualitative. We interviewed respondents and all the forces that we visited, and we supplemented our interview data with a survey of staff. And then we collected further data um, from uh, uh, internal reports that have been generated, evaluations, reviews that have been generated by the forces themselves. Um, I'll, I'll go through um, what we found under the headings of uh, marketing and recruitment, training, uh, trainees welfare, pay and rewards, uh, PQF, come back to PQF and degree entry. That was, a, that was something that everybody wanted to talk about. So it would be wrong not to mention that. And then I'll kind of con conclude with you know, some of what we felt we knew about the programs. Um, so first of all, in terms of marketing and recruitment, I mean, the, the programs, all the programs we saw, all three programs that we, we looked at um, were marketed very, innovatively uh, a lot of resources were, were put into the to the marketing this, this was something you could see that the, the forces really wanted to to work they wanted to 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 um to, to be able to turn around and say that they you know they'd achieved their targets which were as i've said to recruit a more, a more diverse workforce and to uh, bring in new skills um, particularly in, the, in in obvious regions i guess so things like cyber crime um, the, none of the schemes were open to serving officers, so they were all trying to, you know, looking for this the kind of new talent, if you like. Um, it was difficult to compare, like we, we weren't comparing like with like. It was very much oranges and, and apples because the data that the forces collected was was different, you know, to meet their own their, their own expectations, their own requirements. Um, what we could say is that um, in total, in the three forces, eight hundred applicants. 800 people applied for the for the for the, for the courses. Um, 266 were invited to search, which is the National Assessment Center. And there's an issue around search, which I'll mention later. Um, to just a, a very large proportion of those candidates were interviewed. Uh, 204, in fact, were selected for internal assessment, so interviews in the forces to see um, uh, if they would be employed. And of those 120 passed uh, the internal assessment and 88 were appointed. Uh, and that broke down to 32 in force, sorry, 17 in force A, 32 in force B and 39 in force C. Um, did, this, did the course, did the schemes attract applicants with new skills? I think, yes, broadly. Um, trainees had professional experience in engineering, midwifery, legal practice, probation, teaching, uh, uh, national, natural sciences, um, and forces, I think, overall found that they were successful in attracting more diverse groups than uh, common uh, comment to me was that um, more diverse than you would expect from standard recruitment campaigns. Um, and I made a point to myself here that however, in at least one case, they could have had even greater success if the selection process was more finely attuned to the aims. Um, in one of the forces, they had to uh, uh, um, limit the numbers going to the search uh, um, centre, the, the assessment centre. Uh, and, you know, having put all this effort into, you know, I talked about the innovative marketing, uh, big use of social media, lots of resources thrown at the marketing campaign, particularly to attract people from black and ethnic minority communities. Um, they then um, found that they couldn't send as many applicants to the National Assessment Centre as they wanted and uh, uh, in, in limiting that number they lost a large proportion of their um, black and ethnic minority applicants which I thought was really sad um, and, I, and I know it's, it caused a lot of soul searching in, 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 in the force and I think they you know I'm sure the learning was taken on board but you know I think what we found um, was true in a lot of cases, in all the cases really, was that insufficient uh, um, attention had been paid to the kind of pressure on the other parts of the force that were, 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 would inevitably, inevitably be created by bringing in a new, new schemes like, like these. 
So the schemes themselves were, 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 seemed to be very well resourced, well marketed, advertised, and supported. But then, you know, staff coming into the in, into a force needed support for you know welfare support, administrative administrative support. There was more support required for trainers. Uh, trainers' knowledge of detective work was was limited in some cases. So it was it was kind of um, that, that was that, I think that sounds kind of bad on its own. Uh, as a bald fact, but I think it was indicative of, of, of a wider issue that they, kind of people needed to think maybe a bit longer and harder about what it actually meant to bring in whole cohorts of, kind of uh, you know, more staff in the way that they did. Um, so I talked about the fact that each of the forces uh, trained the applicants to be um, uniform cops first so they're trained to be on the competent and, and um, forces felt that was important, particularly the smaller forces that uh, they, they needed to be able to, um, you know, deploy or redeploy detectives sometimes to, to uniform, uh, whether it be patrol work or police in protest or whatever. So they, 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 the, that was a priority that people were safe and lawful, as I said, as, as cops before they were on to be detectives. And in terms of training across the board, you know, we, 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 we were really impressed with the commitment of people directly involved in the program, supervisors, training staff, and so on. And of course, the trainees themselves were, I, I, you know, I thought they were huge, hugely impressive uh, as, a, as a body of people. Um, and there was a, almost an absence of the kind of scepticism that you might expect to be, almost total absence of the scepticism you might expect to be a part of a new scheme like this, um, you know, and uh, you know, I talked about some of the comments, that, you know, the heat in the debate earlier, and the, you know, the cynicism that seemed to, to, or at least you know, heavy criticism that seemed to pervade so much of the commentary on the subject, was almost completely absent from our interactions with, with research respondents, and that was with the trainees, clearly, um, but more with the, you know, existing staff, no matter what stage of their service they were, where they were in the in in, in the um, in the organisation. We find huge support for, for, for the programs. And I think that maybe is reflective of um, the fact that, you know, this, there was this 5,000 shortfall and there was, there was a, 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 you know, considered to be an absolute need for, for more help. And, and, and almost again, I don't want to kind of um, suggest that it wasn't, there, there wasn't a kind of fulsome praise for what, 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 the, what management were doing, but I think it was also, a kind of, uh, you know, we desperately need some help, but we don't care where it's coming from. The element to this as well, and where, where you know, where the balance was between the two poles of that argument. Um, I couldn't decide. I'll leave that for you to decide. Uh, most of the training delivered met trainees' needs most of the time, but a significant theme that emerged was that um, CID or detective detectives needed to have detectives involved in their training, and I and, I, and I've just done a few uh, because although we. I was commissioned uh, again in January, we didn't actually start research because of COVID and various other issues until the beginning of May. And, and, in, and in the interviews I've done so far, this, this is still, um, comes through very strongly from the, from the trainees that they, they, want to, they, they wanted more detective involvement and they wanted to be a, a, able to feel that they belong to the, to the detective uh, force rather than the wider police family. Um, Everybody I've spoken to says that they needed that engagement at a much earlier stage. It's a common theme. Um, and I think, you know, the concept of socialising new recruits into military or police life through, through processes of role modelling and conditioning, we've all seen it at the Army films, I'm sure. You know, it's long been a feature of police training too. And that was, a, in, some, in, in a couple of cases, that... Um, kind of message was delivered to trainees that they're not special that they're just just recruits you know like everybody else and they have to conform and i think that uh, that was unhelpful in some case i think that set back uh, the system the, 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 the uh, trainees progress uh, in a couple of cases um so in terms of their welfare um perhaps unsurprisingly some trainees struggled um and a number of welfare issues, welfare related issues emerged. And, and the programs, I, I, again, it's about thinking longer and harder about the, 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 the intricacies of, of, of a program like this. 
that if you know if you look at it that somebody's somebody who's new has no experience of policing is coming into the police they're being trained they need to train they're trained to be a, a uniform cop and at the same time they're being trained to, to be a um, detective and they're also having to um uh, uh, complete a study for an NIE, which is a, you know a fairly heavy law law exam. So there's a big there's a big demand on 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 students and those and it uh, we could see that um, those with uh, uh, you know greater life experience and more experience in a kind of in a similar role uh, in, in some not necessarily a police role but say for example one one candidate had been involved uh, for, for several years uh, so had been in, in a role in uh, working for a local authority for several years where she'd been involved in um, eviction evictions planning evictions working with bailiffs that kind of thing so she, and, and 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 going to court regularly so you know people with that kind of background again i don't think this is at all this is at all surprising finding but that kind of background seemed to settle more quickly to the to the, to the onto the pathway than, than others and what was really critical was the role of mentors. Now, in each case, courses had planned to appoint a mentor. So as soon as people joined the program uh, and were in their kind of uniform training stage, they would be given a, somebody within the C, CID that they could contact and have that link into and then uh, greater understanding about what they were being asked to do as detectives going forward. And that, that, that worked well in, in, in one case and not so well in other cases. And that, and that played out, I think, in, in attrition, I mean, where, where mentoring was, was, was not so good. Attrition from the, from the programme was, was high, uh, um, particularly in one force where policy decision was made to allow people to remain in uniform. Um, attrition was very high. Uh, um, and largely, when I, when I spoke to uh, recruits who were taken, not trainees, who had taken that path, uh, it was just that they they enjoyed the work so much they kind of almost stayed in uniform too long and this is a very difficult balance I I, I completely get um, stayed in uniform too long and enjoyed the work so much they didn't want to go and sit into what they saw as the hardship of detective work um, so it's kind of unintended consequence of the program um, uh, many respondents raised the subject of paying rewards and I think that you know there's a bigger issue here I think around um, uh, detective pay you know and social hours that, that you know that kind of stuff and, I, and I, when I look back the history of detective work and see that um, certainly isn't as attractive in terms of in terms of um, overtime payments or kind of allowances as as uniform work so again this was another thing was pulling people away from the pathways and on back onto the uniform part of life um, it was notable that um, many uh, uh, trainees had taken substantial pay cuts to join the police. So there's something very attractive about being a detective, uh, at least initially anyway. Um, and they were happy in the role, but but they were also very, um, you know, looking forward to specialization and particularly promotion. So um, again, that was something we flagged up with the police actually to think about because the, 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 the schemes were, were operated as a kind of as a way of uh, making up the shortfall of staff, particularly in safeguarding and criminal investigation de departments. You know, the kind of real front end of policing. So there's a question about you know how long were those recruits were willing, uh, happy to stay in the front end and not look to you know progress into the in further institution like everybody else. Um, you know that was that was really interesting. I think. Um, and then under the PQF and degree entry, and I think it's just worth saying you know, that, that uh, you know, of all the people we've interviewed and all the people I've interviewed in the second phase of research, not one person thinks that uh, the, 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 being a police officer should be restricted to those who hold a degree. And, and the common arguments put forward are around um, representation of the community. You know, you know, the idea that not everybody in society has a degree, so therefore, um, why should, you know why should the police who are supposed to reflect society hold a degree and um you know i know this is this is an argument uh, or discussion rather that's, that's been going on for years and i was reading jenny brown's paper again yesterday about the benefits of a police degree over another degree and and, and i think without wishing to to misquote jennifer i think the idea that you know any degree is useful in terms of intellectual development and, and so on not necessarily to, doesn't necessarily have to be a police degree but, but all, I mean, all I can say is from the 
the, the trainees that I interviewed, I was very impressed, really impressed with the, the quality, the knowledge, the motivation, and the capability of, 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 of many of the trainees who were on the programs and who did not have a degree uh, and had no, because they were, you know, at the stage of their life, with family commitments or uh, uh, as, as carers, you know, but didn't feel that was something that they would be able to do to go back and get a degree. And, and, and you know, that's something that's going to trouble me a lot through the research, I would say. And then when I was finished and writing the research, there was still the argument about whether forces would be able to continue to run programs like this, uh, not have to be bound by PQF was, was still a live one. But I think now having returned to it, um, you know, in the last few months, I think that they've, they've, unfortunately those, you know, champions of that, uh, they've lost you know it's a it's it's uh it's it's something that uh, uh policing has kind of um surrendered to if you like it's probably not the best expression but it's one i feel is appropriate um so one, in one particular force we thought i mean i'm looking at the time so i'll just uh, sum up by saying in, in one particular force uh force a we felt they just got it right uh um the uh uh, trainees didn't stay in, they stayed in uniform long enough to get the safe and lawful badge, but not so long that they were tempted to stay, that they didn't kind of, they were happy to go into, into the CRD. And maybe that's because they also, they were mentored very well. And I've just interviewed the person who runs that scheme, second time around, as it were. And now, we're, now, now people from that scheme have been promoted, but they've actually stayed on the CRD or, and, and some of the trainees, I interviewed 18 months ago are now mentoring new trainees coming through which uh, and I know the force is, is I, I know there'll be reservations about um, um, these the, the schemes out there but all I can say is that the force force itself is extremely happy with the the quality of the of the recruits the schemes are churning out for them and are very unhappy they have to um, stop the program soon uh, because of PQF. Uh, so I mean, in thinking about the question, I did so. The, so, has have the schemes um, helped to diversify the workforce? Well, definitely yes, in terms of gender. Less less so in terms of uh, um, from from uh, ethnic or, or or hard to reach communities. And I think that more work needs to be done there. And it's something I'm I'm, I'm look, looking at again in in phase two. Uh, and does it bring forward new skills? I think that the, the, the evidence is equivocal. I think in some cases, uh, but but often those skills are held by people who have come down a different route to, to being a degree holder. And of course, going forward, they they will not be allowed to join the scheme. So, um, so that's a kind of it was not conclusions as I say because the, the research is is ongoing. But um, you know, I, think I would just say that in, in summary that. To me, that the the, the courses, the, the program showed huge promise, and uh, it's a real shame that uh, they're going to have to end for all the reasons I've, I've kind of touched on already. Um, I think Ben, if uh, I'll, I'll stop there. That's that's great. Thanks ever so much, Adrian. That's absolutely fascinating. And I have, I have a number of questions, but I will I will save them to the end. <laughs> and if I have time to ask them, I remember. I think this is one point of clarification um, that we'll we'll deal with now. And the other questions are coming in, we'll save for the panel at the end. Um, but someone's asking how the mentors were chosen and assigned. The mentors were experienced detectives, and and then which which you know we highlighted in the study, of course, that also meant that those who were the most kind of busiest <laughs> uh, and also sometimes the most capable became the more, you know, even more busy because they were then having to, and uh, the, 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 the argument was put forward by, by uh, those managers of the course that was uh, that um, mentors would help trainees, you know, share caseloads with trainees. But in fact, that's, that's, I've never seen that happen. Trainees have their own case, though mentors have their, uh, have their own case, though. So it's a heavy burden on on on. Uh, it's increasing the burden on those who are the most busy, you know. So there's a real challenge, and I think that is one of the advantages I think about the program in Force A now, where recruits are coming through and are are now meant are now now being mentors to the new to the recruits coming after them. You know, I think that's um, you have to have that kind of churn. I think otherwise you're what you're doing is, uh, 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 in, in, you know, you're, you're ameliorating the problem in one area, but you're increasing it in, an, in, in another. Yeah. 
Brilliant, thank you. Don't go away because we'll need you for the panel later on because there's some more questions coming that I think about you. Um, but we'll, we'll now move on to, to the next uh, group of speakers actually. Um, so we have three speakers for the next presentation, uh, Stephen Tong and Martin O'Neill from Canterbury Christchurch University and Stephen Clayman um, from the Metropolitan Police Service. Um, and they're gonna be talking, well, you can see the title there, uh, Responding to Police Workforce Transformation, Detective Recruitment and Training. And I think probably Steve, over to you. Yes, thank you, Ben. Um, just uh, unclicking my mute and video. Uh, th thank you for the introduction. Um, and uh, as Ben says, there'll be three of us presenting today. Um, uh, Steve Clayman from the Metropolitan Police Service, who's leading on, on this particular project, and then myself, Steve Tong, and Martin O'Neill, who uh, led on the research. Um, so um, just to give you a bit of background, really, to the, um, the research, I think it's important to kind of some of the changes that have occurred over the years prior to this particular development and I think going back to the Edmund Davies committee in 1978 is quite important because what that signaled was a change in in police terms and conditions and it's not often talked about there was a high attrition uh, of people being in the police service prior to that particular arrangement and what we started to see was officers um, uh, commonly pursuing a 30-year career, um, they they got improved pay and pensions, and there was retention. And then often we see in more recent times is how that experience within the police service is lost as, as people retire as part of those terms and conditions. Um, there's also other kind of characteristics, things people will talk about, about uh, detective training and history. Uh, and you can see the next bullet point where, uh, about the 10-week detective training course, which was in the 80s and 90s, and reduced to six weeks and this is a time when uh, police abstraction uh, from duty because their training is becoming more important and training is is changing and developing but in 1993 the government starting to see that government is quite uh, policing is quite expensive and the Sheehy uh, inquiry that involved a, a, a young researcher called David Cameron um, was involved in trying to look at different ways of paying the police and, and performance arrangements and these kinds of things and I don't know if any of you will, will remember uh, but uh, Wembley was full of police officers when uh, um, a protest uh, was, was arranged in terms of the concerns of, of some of those proposals that seemed to, to to, to be implemented over the years. But what that signalled was the first time that the cost of policing was becoming uh, uh, very clear to government and it was something that they wanted to um, uh, to reduce. And what we've also seen is this, 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 this police work is very much as a craft, it's learnt on the job. Um, you learn it through experience as well as training school. And we've often seen in, in, in up to date and dated pieces of research where there can be this notion of forget what you learn in training school this is where you learn the real life the real job on the on the streets themselves and that's not just in the UK it's uh, globally um, in, in various uh, police studies so I think that's quite important that the pr training provider whether they're a university or, 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 or uh, a police training uh, environment have, have been open to these uh, criticisms for long periods of time um, but then we can start to see where developments like the, mur the murder manual, the professionalising investigation process, which is known as PIP, PIP levels one, two and three and level two is particularly associated with the qualification of a detective constable a substantive detective constable, and then the uh, core investor of doctrine. So these attempts were to articulate more clearly what detective work was about and to try and develop uh, uh, teaching and, and learning packages that was assist in that learning. And then in 2008, the losing the detectives report from the Police Federation was very important in that it, it indicated that there seemed to be a, a change in what was, was happening. You know, detective status that had been traditionally high was su suddenly suffering from uh, morale issues, uh, uh, people not being particularly happy in the job, uh, detectives uh, being more difficult to recruit um, and detectives uh, uh, moving on sometimes. Um, and then, of course, we had austerity and austerity is really important because a lot about investigation can be the, the background support. And we remember the government um, commentary around this to say that frontline policing uh, would not be affected. And there was lots of debates around, well, what is frontline policing? What does that mean in terms of, um, you know, where these cuts will fall? And then in, in um, 
in the 2011 to 12, we can see Windsor again, another attempt at looking at the costs of policing and then policing vision 2025 and, and police transformation is a way of looking forward to the police service in this world that we're seeing that change really dramatically how the police going to change and adapt an organization that has been noted for its resistance to change but also we're seeing the world around us change dramatically too more people going into university compare that to the 1970s when fewer people fewer uh, a proportion of the population would even have the opportunity to go to university. Now that's been transformed through various uh, government approaches. And then in 2018, what we're going to talk about today is the Detective Constable Pathway. There was an initiative introduced by the Metropolitan Police in response to the police transformation um, uh, policy. And then, as, as uh, Adrian uh, mentioned, there's the police education qualification framework that was introduced and then the degree entry holder programme, which is essentially the programme that you would join with a degree to become a detective. And that succeeded the programme we're going to talk today. And as you can see from the bullet point, uh, that was uh, introduced in 2020 and 2021. So that's very recent. These, the, this, this very the last programme is, is uh, in a very uh, early stages. Um, so I hope that gives you a bit of a selection of how detective work and uh, detective learning and training has, has kind of developed and, and some of the policies that have, uh, have affected that. So in terms of police work transformation, it's not just about one particular thing or direct entry schemes. It's about looking at the police organisation as a whole in terms of having um, a workforce um, that, that's agile and can adapt and is going to have the appropriate skills and abilities in place at the right time um, and meeting those challenges required. You know, we often hear about digitalization, um, the way that crime's committed now, same crimes being committed just in a different way, and that technology is, is becoming uh, a more, uh, more important um, uh, uh, kind of influence on how some of these things are. Uh, 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 committed and, and, the, and the police having to try and keep up to date with some of those changes both in the personnel that they have and the technology that they've used so we've seen all kinds of uh, changes uh, in, in relation to that so it's it's very fluid we're in an era of the fourth industrial revolution um and and we can see how pl policing is having to respond and change um quite quickly so just very quickly a few bullet points about police workforce uh, transformation which is you know directly influencing this uh, detective uh, uh, constable pathway um, that we're, it's looking at reform in terms of uh, recruitment systems uh, uh, direct entry routes into policing from PCSOs through to more specialist roles um, the apprenticeship roles that have been um, mentioned as part of the PEQF and obviously leadership director entry roles in terms of inspectors and superintendents. But there's also changes in terms of leadership transformations. And you probably remember the time when um, uh, David Cameron stood at the dispatch box when he was prime minister and criticised the fact that too many police officers look like white, pale males. Um, and that, that was followed very shortly by the, the Windsor Review. So we can see that uh, uh, there's attempts to transform the police um, in, in, in quite dramatic ways. I'm just going to pass over to Steve Clayman now, who's going to talk about uh, the key points in terms of uh, the Metropolitan Police changes. Thanks, Steve. Um, so just to really just uh, touch on what the Met were doing, and, and, I, and I just wanted to point out really that the, the drive for the Met doing this was twofold. Firstly, it was, yeah, there was an element certainly around detective resilience, definitely. But actually, the main driver for this was workforce transformation and how you get people who wouldn't ordinarily have considered policing into policing. So there were two drivers for this. I think a lot of people quite rightly focus on detective numbers and resilience, but that wasn't the sole reason. So we launched a pilot in 2016. I, I still remember to this day in I was addressing a group of uh, police federation, the detective uh, federation members uh, in the north of England. And it was a very tough, act, tough, tough gig uh, when I was taking them through some of the thoughts uh, around what we were going to do. Um, and we started with a small pilot of special constables uh, we, that taught us a little bit about the recruitment, it taught us about the training. As a result of that, we changed the way the training, which you'll hear about, uh, actually came into being. So we launched the external campaign in um, 2017. And again, I should add, 
we did this, but before we did this, we tested the market. So we tested through a quite an extensive market research across London uh, to test this and to see if there was if it was there was an appetite for it, and there really was uh, an appetite for it. And the reason that the interesting thing is when I looked at previous research into why uh, people would join policing, one of the key attractors was a what they call uniform attractor, wearing a uniform. So I thought, well, is, is there another end to this scale? And there certainly was, because, you know, believe it or not, not everyone is attracted to policing to put on a uniform. Now, some, I know some uh, colleagues find that quite hard to listen to, the fact that not everyone wants to join as a uniform constable, but, and there are people who don't want to put a uniform on and want to do another aspect of the role. And that was telling us that. So when we launched in May 17, we were overwhelmed with applications. Our very first launch day, we had over, I think we did some media stuff, we had a thousand applications in the next sort of week, just on the back of it. And to the day, since we did the initial campaign, we've never re-advertised. Uh, when you see the numbers we've recruited, we've never had to re-advertise. There's been a constant pool of people who are, uh, who want to join uh, policing in this way. So first intake arrived in 2018. I mean that, you know, and we're at a position now and I've put the figures up, you can see, you know, we've recruited over a thousand. Um, now I should just, a bit of a context here. The Met is in the position to do things at scale. It's just the way the Met is. We're, we're, we're very big. We're, we have the ability to do volume recruitment, even in something as, as specialized as this. So that's why the numbers are big and not every force can do that. And I, I recognize that. And I was talking to a lot of forces with the College of Policing around all the other routes that you've, you've heard about. We were fortunate that we could test and actually design and bring something in, in this way. Um, and we're really at a stage now where we've got this number of people and the, and the remarkable thing, and you'll hear a bit more about this in terms of diversity. Now the Met always had a target across the board of 50% recruitment of, of female. Well, we, we smashed that monthly, every month. And, and it, you could, no, I mean, I was getting feedback, noticeable feedback from people in training school, in on the boroughs, when they saw intakes come through noticeably, the balance between male and female. Now our um, ethnic minority recruitment uh, sits just under where we'd like to be as a, as a force generally under our uniform targets. But, you know, from a, from a gender perspective, incredible um, success. We now, we've now launched the DHEP detective. So it's a, a program spec, it's formalized through the PQF. So there is a legacy, people are able to, albeit it's a degree holder entry pathway. And we took the decision quite early to make this a degree entry, even with the previous scheme, we made it uh, a degree entry uh, scheme. And you'll see the attrition. Now, you know, you expect to lose people. We lose uniform PCs for all sorts of reasons. And again, we'll touch on that later. Some, some people, the job just wasn't for them, and we'll come on to that uh, uh, in a mo. Steve, if I could ask for the next slide, please. So broadly, what we were doing really was taking the existing uh, IPLDP uh, syllabus curriculum, tweaking it, because of course, the main thing here is we were looking at the Office of Constable, and you know, the, the, the point was made in the previous presentation about having to make sure that, you know, if you're holding the Office of Constable, you've got the understanding of what that means. So actually the foundation training they were doing was not wholly dissimilar to what our or the uniform colleagues were doing. However, it was broken up more and there was an investigative uh, slant on everything they were doing. And also some of the elements of the uh, advanced CID training, the ICIDP course was brought in a bit earlier. So we're doing interview training earlier. So that was all very much built in with punctuated by these three coming to your boroughs, getting to know the roles, and more importantly, getting to know the role of your uh, uniform colleagues, understanding how the two work hand in hand because they're so closely aligned. There was once that the, the sort of foundation training, remember this is in-house training, there was a 12 week development phase on their BCU, so in their boroughs, uh, where they would get the support. And I'll talk a bit more later about the support, but we introduced investigative coaches at the same time to provide dedicated support to um, those uh, TDCs who, who were arriving. They had to undertake the study for the NIE, which, you know, it's not an easy exam. What I would say is the, certainly in the first year, they were 
um, the, the results they were getting, uh, they, were, they raised the MET pass rate by 10% because you know, learning a new role, they were still passing the NOE really well. Um, and then of course, it really followed the natural, the normal route for an internal sort of progression for a detective. So there was a bit of symmetry there, but we're now on the stage where some now have done through their three years on their boroughs, some many are remaining, some have now moved into specialist commands, other roles in the Met, some no doubt going for promotion. And all these things were thought about. Um, and I'm not, by everything I'm saying here, which you'll hear, I'm not suggesting it was all smooth and plain sailing because it wasn't. Um, there's a lot of learning that, that, that's come out, but that was the program the two-year program in essence, but I'll pass back uh, over for the next, uh, next bit. Okay, thank you, Steve. Um, so that gives you a bit of background and uh, some of the Mets that approaches to, uh, to the, um, the pathway. Um, so in terms of the research, we were looking to explore the views of the, the trainees. We wanted to get their experience going through training um, and um, you know, different operational phases as well. But we also wanted to speak to others involved in the process. So, uh, you know, it's not just the trainee perspective. And as you can imagine, COVID uh, did hit us partway through the research. So there was a there, there was, was some kind of a, a, a adaptation. So in, in total, uh, we had a mixed methods approach. We had a couple of weeks of observation. So it wasn't an ethnography, but it was just insight and observation into the, the training environment. And we had interviews uh, and, and surveys. Um, about 22 uh, focus group and individual groups. Um, and then what we did, we followed um, cohorts through. Now, one of the things with these cohorts is they weren't consistent all the way through because they would take the NIE at different times and therefore they would get on um, uh, different cohorts for the next stages of training, the foundation training and the ICID training. So as you can see, the foundation course, we followed uh, 57 uh, DCP trainees. Uh, we, we surveyed them at the beginning and end um, of their training and conducted interviews with trainers and, and the trainees. And then the ICID P course, the initial uh, police training course, which is four weeks in duration, was uh, a mixture of both uh, traditional pathway that we call TP. So these are the police officers who have joined the police service and then specialised as being a detective. So they can have a minimum of two years probation under their belt. They can have four, five, ten years uniform experience before becoming a detective. And they were alongside the DCP detectives, as, as, uh, uh, as Steve's uh, uh, chart showed, showed earlier on. And then um, at the end of the survey, uh, so um, at the end of the research, this is around um, September, October um, 2020, we did a final survey and what we wanted was responses from everybody who had completed their training and become substantive. So as you can see in the, the uh, table below, that was 226 um, training detectives who had become substantive, 190 of those were from the traditional pathway and uh, 36 were uh, from um, uh, the DCP. Um, so at this point, that just gives you a bit of background to our approach. I'm just going to pass you on to my colleague, uh, Martin O'Neill, who is going to speak to you about recruitment and, and training. Thank you, Steve. Yeah, um, so the, the, that first paragraph there is, is basically reflecting uh, what Steve uh, Clayman said. Um, when he was talking about the, the success of the recruitment and application uh, process, um, that those statistics are pretty um, inspiring in terms of what you've got there, 2,700 applications, uh, 960 uh, individuals um, began their training during that uh, two year period. And you can see the demographics there. Um, are pretty astounding in relation to uh, you know the amount of females 54.3% as opposed to 45.7% for males and you've got the ethnic minority uh, officers represented there 17.8% now that reflects really favorable with national national averages and of course the met is uh, you know slightly different but um you know as of about July last year you're talking about 7.3% for ethnic minority officers throughout the country you're talking about 31 percent female officers throughout the country so very very favorable figures uh, from that recruitment and of course it also shows i think um and and everybody said it so far the enduring uh popularity i suppose of uh criminal investigation 
um, not just for um, people who want to become detectives, uh, but, but also in terms of um, looking at uh, degree, undergraduate degrees that, that offer criminal investigation uh, as a subject matter, you, you, you get in that sort of enduring popularity. Um, so in the, the second paragraph deals with the motivations of the officers for uh, the recruitment and for the application process, because um, what, what's really interesting there is, uh, again, you've got different reasons about why people might want to uh, join and become detectives. Uh, some of them were already experienced in their own careers and they wanted to seek uh, a different career challenge. Some of them wanted to really pursue that uh, investigative role. Um, uh, some of them wanted to uh, help people, make a difference to the public. Um, and some of them wanted to just seek uh, a challenge. And that's interesting. Maybe this is the, the opposite to what Steve Clayman was talking about there in terms of not a uniform detractor. Uh, you know, people are attracted uh, to this idea of uh, performing a role uh, as a detective. So that, that was quite interesting too. Um, in the final uh, paragraph that you've got there, um, this, this is something I think that Steve Clayman added, but you know, overall, uh, the recruitment uh, for, for traditional uh, pathway detectives was actually in decline at the time. Um, and the DCP uh, candidate recruitment was definitely increasing, but this is now uh, leveling out. Um, but what the what the figures do show is they show uh, that there is a reliance uh, on detectives in training, and so when, you know, one of the most important things that uh, of the whole thing uh, is that retention of these individuals is very very uh, important. And I've said this before: um, it, it, it's good to recruit more, uh, but it's also uh, better to keep them and make sure that they're developed uh, in the appropriate uh, way. Steve, next slide. So uh, just a few headline issues from uh, each of the different types of training uh, that the DCP candidates and the others uh, went through. So foundation training, which was, uh, as Steve said, um, was, you know, it basically your foundation course uh, with a few uh, issues uh, developed within it. So um, it, th there was a real uh, uh, issue uh, in terms of uh, for the for the candidates to have to learn not only what it is to be a police constable but also to learn about being a detective by by the end of the program there's a real sense of uh, it, tension uh, between having to learn both of those things in a in a very short um, space of time um, and of course you've got to have sympathy I think with uh, people that are running these kinds of programs because you get a feeling, and I think it is true, that uh, they have, they're slightly hamstrung uh, by what the College of Policing uh, wanted in the past in, in terms of people being uh, developed as a police constable, so the core skills of policing, as well as on top of that, uh, the investigative function. So there's a real difficulty in trying to uh, develop a, a programme and a course that actually is able to do both uh, in, a, in a nicely balanced way. Um, there was some uh, some feedback from from candidates about um, that they wanted to, a provision of more investigative focus on those courses. And like I say, that's why it's difficult because you know there, there are there are minimum standards that the uh, the Met had to keep keep to because of College of Policing requirements. Um, oh, one of the interesting things is that um, Adrian mentioned earlier, which was about whether detectives should be the trainers etc cetera, etc cetera. um I, I think we found that that is that is true and you know they wanted a, a a real sort of sense of real detectives teaching these uh these students and the candidates that were going forward but i think there was also an issue around some of them some of those detectives that were selected they had very little training to be trainers and sometimes that can be a little that can be dangerous in its own right unless they have some sort of minimum uh, standard of training and I don't think that's uh, you know just the MET the MET program where that happened I think that's something that needed to be considered uh, in a little bit more detail and I know that uh, the program did deal with that uh, uh, later on. Um, so 66% uh, of DCP candidates at the end of foundation course training 
didn't believe that the foundation that the training was actually suitable for their next phase of development and they suggested lots of different um, improvements uh, that could that could uh, uh, develop the, the program which uh, the Met were very quick to uh, try to rectify more practical rather than theoretical content um, requests for further training on specific areas uh, uh, Steve Clayman mentioned interviewing interviewing was one of them general investigation and some of the uh, Metropolitan Police um, uh, crime uh, systems etc they were mentioned a lot in the training uh, in the foundation course but they, they didn't really have access or much uh, to do with those things uh, in the training so it was almost like it was something that they kept hearing um, so that was the 57 initial uh, candidates uh, that, that we tried to uh, follow through and then eventually some of those candidates would have would have gone on to the initial crime investigative development program uh, which is the, the basically effectively the CID uh, course. So what we were able to do then is follow 23 uh, DCP candidates, as you can see there, and 18 traditional pathway uh, candidates who were all, as uh, Steve Tonga said, they were all in together now. So they were mixing uh, these two different uh, types of uh, cohorts. So following uh, completion of the ICIDP, what was interesting is that the candidates at uh, the DCP and traditional pathway held similar views about the relevance and value uh, of detective training, including its strengths and weaknesses, um, comments concerning the delivery of the training and the need for relevance and practical learning are shared, despite the fact that there's the difference in uh, the, the way that these uh, officers have developed, etc., and their experiences. Um, what was what was actually quite uh, repetitive well sorry what, what actually came up quite a lot from the DCP candidates was uh, they said the repetitive nature of some of the things that they were being uh, taught and that to be fair that might be something to do with trying to give them a little bit more investigative input earlier uh, rather than wait till the ICIDP. Um, the majority of the traditional pathway candidates did feel that the training that they received on the ICIDP was suitable for the role that they were performing uh, as a detective on, on their BCU. Um, but the DCP candidates, 63% of them, and a, a, a smaller minority of the, the, the traditional pathway candidates, didn't feel that the training was suitable for the role. Um, that, and that's quite interesting. By the end of the four week course, 77.3% um, of DCP and 50% of TP trainees reported high or very high confidence in becoming a substantive detective. Thanks, Steve. So uh, workplace development uh, is the final, the final phase that I'm just going to be uh, talking about here. Um, and, and this did actually raise a few interesting uh, issues. Um, so first of all, um, almost all of the DCP candidates reported that they were provided with materials for their um, for, for to, to assist them in their development, compared to only uh, sixty one percent uh, of the the traditional pathway officers, and 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 there was a sense, of course, that they would say that there's a there's an inequality there in terms of the way that they were treated. Um, interestingly, though, all eighteen traditional pathway candidates were given protected learning time whilst only 8.7% of the uh, Detective Constable Pathway candidates were given uh, that support. Um, and, and that's interesting in its own, in, in its own right. Um, and, and the traditional pathway detectives felt that the Detective Constable Pathway uh, candidates received better support from the investigative coaches. So there, there seemed to be like a little bit of, uh, you know, some, some inequalities, but not, not specifically towards one uh, cohort. It, it seemed to be like um, a sporadic, I suppose. Uh, both sets of candidates highlighted good support from their supervisors and line managers, but there was a lot much less uh, satisfaction uh, with the support provided by investigative coaches. Um, but I think it needs to be said at that point that even though that was the case, um, there was some really good, excellent examples, I suppose, of uh, the way that the coaches did actually support uh, candidates uh, in the workplace. I suppose what we're looking at there is we're looking at 
again, sporadic um, support, a, a good support for these candidates in the workplace. And we've already said, haven't we, that um, you know one of the things is retention is really important. Um, and so I, I, I would suggest that you know part of the that retention is once they get to uh, their area or borough or whatever it might be, uh, you would want that support to be very, very good. Uh, in order to support them through that development phase when it's probably the steepest learning curve that they're going to have once they uh, hit the ground to actually do their um, detective work. Um, yeah, and that's another thing. A workload was reported as being very high by a large number of the respondents uh, without that necessary learning support in place. So, you know, you can imagine how some candidates uh, were feeling um, and they felt that they had that that really huge workload, um, and that and that was um, detrimental to their uh, development. Uh, I think we made some suggestions elsewhere that you know may, maybe as someone gets phased in uh, to to a borough or whatever it might be, that they could phase the amount of work that they receive rather than get full uh, load. Uh, maybe that could be phased in as they develop. Um, uh, in addition, trainees felt um, concern over the requirement to complete workbooks at the same time as, as having to do uh, have that pressing uh, sort of workloads, etc. Um, uh, and, and then I suppose the final point about the work the workload issue is many respondents felt that 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 was because of staff shortages. That's why their workload uh, was actually high. Um, wh whether that's actually right or not, that's how, that's how they actually felt. Um, rotation of officers to gain experience of different types of investigators role, uh, roles is considered important, um, but, but it's not always available. Um, and there was evidence of an inconsistent approach in that. Um, first of all, in terms of availability, secondly, in terms of accessibility, uh, and that was all considered a bit um, inconsistent, particularly around training, uh, etc. cetera. Um, again, looking at that, um, you wouldn't want uh, your your officers and this this is the sort of thing that came out you wouldn't want your for instance your officers to just be um ha have experience of working in in a, a, a vulnerable victim uh, unit or something like that without uh, whilst they're developing getting getting experience of working in other parts of uh, the business the investigative business so that the the the, the, the officer that's developed is a more rounded uh, detective thanks steve next one Okay, so so the last one here is just a few quotes from, uh, as Steve uh, Tong said at the beginning, what we tried to do is we tried to uh, also get some uh, views from investigative coaches and detective sergeants and inspectors to, to you know to get a, a more rounded view ourselves. Um, and these are just a few uh, quotes that we we, uh, we wanted to show you about some of the things that people uh, said. I think you know some headlines. I'm not going to go through them all because of time, but. You've got things like I, I found the caliber of candidate very high. The only thing they lack is experience. Well, I mean, and, and that's going to be a pretty obvious uh, thing. Uh, the majority, according to one investigative coach, uh, have developed into first class investigators. Um, some TDCs, according to an investigative uh, coach, fly and become confident detective constables. Others find it daunting and have told me they have little support. So. Um, there's, there's an interesting uh, aspect there, and I think I'll just do uh, one more, and then and then I'll probably uh, hand it over to somebody else. Uh, let's do the top one. In the majority of cases, the officers who complete the detective uh, program, whether they're a traditional pathway officer or DCP, will have met all the aims and objectives. They show a significant increase in skill levels, and reach the standard I would expect to see in a detective. They often confirm by this is often confirmed by the comments of officers, first line managers who speak highly of skills of their officers and their abilities in investigating crime. So there's some, you know, very positive comments about the skill sets of the uh, individuals, um, as sometimes matched against the traditional pathway detectives. Thanks, Steve. Thanks, Martin. Um... Uh, one thing I just wanted to say at this point is um, what we were doing through the research is reporting back our findings um, to Steve and his team, and they were making a, 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 um, 
constant changes um, in terms of trying to improve things on, on, on the system in responses to some of these these feedback and the internal feedback that they that they had received. So in many respects, the feedback that we're giving you um, right to the end hasn't tested the changes that were put in place. These are before those changes, so that's also important. What we don't know is how effective those changes were after because we haven't spoken to those participants again because the, 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 the research finished. So just to, if, you, if you could bear that in mind in terms of what, we're, what some of the views we're, we're kind of um, feeding back to you. The other important thing to remember was at the time there was a major um, uh, reform in terms from boroughs to BCU. So that reorganisation was also happening during this, you know, this significant reform in terms of police training and that, uh, you know, detective departments were receiving essentially probationer police officers for the first time. So this is a huge cultural structural change to what's gone on before. Um, now, when we come to the, the final survey and we're asking people who have completed their training in the previous two years, as you can see, we've, we, we picked up quite a number, up to 190 traditional pathways, and we picked up 36 DCP um, candidates, about 100 DCP candidates had completed their training, become substantive detectives at the time. So that's about 36% of that, that that group of people who we had open to us. Um, now, uh, what we asked them is about how they felt about um, undertaking independent investigation, case file, investigative skills, knowledge of law, their interviews, the core policing skills. Now, in this respect, remember, we were asking them for their perceptions. So we haven't look at their performance data, we haven't observed them. So this is their views. Um, and we conducted a t-test just so you can see some similarities. And you can see some similarities in, in quite a lot of these areas. Where there is substantial differences is, is in, the, in this area of I uh, feel confident in my core skills. Um, now, really the, the, the lower number there, uh, the, 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 the dark green is the DCP. So they were less confident in their core policing skills. This is something they reflected on themselves, but also so did the um, uh, investigative coaches. They saw that, um, that things like confrontation, um, they, they were less skilled at um, and, and more hesitant at. So the, the, there was less confidence in there. So in one sense, that kind of triangulates um, what, what the DCP candidates were kind of reflecting on in terms of themselves. Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to move on quite quickly because of because of time. Um, and we've got a few few slides here that, that, that will be of interest. So interestingly here, when we look at the, um, the question, having completed the training and become a substantive detective, please rate your confidence uh, to perform competently as, as a detective on borough. And what we're really talking about here is someone who could be a detective on night duty and be the person responsible. Um, I did some research on this 20 years ago, um, and it was quite interesting that obviously the, the people I would have uh, conducted research on then uh, were traditional pathway, and they had at least three and a half years investigative experience on average, um, and uh, eight years um, police experience altogether. And they had similar concerns after coming out of training. So when we see that there's two groups here that come from quite different pathways to have uh, fairly similar levels of confidence, I think that's quite interesting. The other thing we wanted to ask them is whether we saw that they, what they thought about being a detective in five years time. You know, we, we've mentioned retention before, um, you know, sometimes, um, you know, there was questions, you know, people might talk about um, other police officers, well, how long are these, these officers going to stay in the job? And you can see that there's some differences there. And now there's quite a few things we perhaps need to consider. We need to consider COVID, you know, is this something that's either attracted or um, not uh, people to stay in the role? Uh, the other thing to bear in mind is that the traditional pathway officers have invested longer in a police career and perhaps uh, they're, they're more likely to want to stay. And this could be the case uh, for DCP candidates further down the line. We, we don't know either way. So uh, that was quite interesting. Um, when we looked at female candidates, they were more positive. Uh, female candidates who were DCP officers were more um, uh, uh, confident about staying in the detective role in five years time. Um, I'm going to pass over to, to, to Steve Clayman now, who's going to talk about uh, some of the changes that, that, that had, were introduced. Yeah, thank you. I, I'm, so I'll keep this fairly brief here. I'm not going to go through 
all the changes to training delivery, you'll see there's a number of things. And to the point that Marty made, we were constantly getting feedback. In fact, we did a quite a major overhaul of the training after the first few cohorts we come through. There was a gap in intakes, and that was that we took a lot of feedback from the uh, recruits themselves and made a lot of changes, as you can see. Two things really on this: the recruitment. You know, we did a number of big warm-up events um, because what was really clear was that the perception of a detective role in reality was very different for some because they were taking a lot of what they'd seen in, in the media and TV uh, and there was very much a need to really ground what detectives do day to day. Now, in all honesty, we still had people joining not quite clear uh, that they were, you know, this was a role you'd be going out and about, you'd be knocking on, going through doors or warrants, whatever, stop and search. You know, there's a lot of work you need to do. So a lot of work we've had to do in that pre sort of pre join literature is really important. Um, the big thing is for me is the, the support. We talked about coaches. We've actually since had a big uh, recruitment drive with coaches. They are an important, stable sort of uh, part of the program now. Um, but also we're driving more about how we get existing DCs to coach line managers to to assist too. And a lot of the work we did, uh, if you move on, um, Steve, was around with the if you, with the PEQF. I was also involved in the rollout. A lot of the things we put very much local N&D units into place, they're now in place, fully staffed. We're in a, such a different place to where we were 18 months ago, uh, and we are developing all the time. So there is a, there is a difference. So some of the big things really in terms of what, what, what did this mean? Um, the business change was really key here. I did a, whilst I did the survey to the public, I did an internal survey around the, the, the scheme. As you can imagine, it, it got met with a wall of negativity, uh, unfortunately from not everyone. There were people in a very negative camp, very positive camp, and people in the middle didn't quite know much about it. And when we explained it, still had some reservations, but wanted to see how it developed. So the importance of good business change in saying what the scheme is and isn't is really important. I mean, I've moved into a role now where I was involved in the design implementation. And over the last two years, I've been in a role where as a BCU commander, I'm I'm receiving them on my BCU as new recruits. And I meet them all, I talk to them all, I ask them why they join, how they're doing. And, you know, I don't get much negative feedback and I keep in touch with my colleagues across the Met. Generally, the feedback's really good, but that's not to say there are big challenges. The workloads are high, you know, there's no shortage of work for them. The support still we need to evolve and get even better than it is now. We're better now at managing probationers in, in investigative units, which we weren't at the beginning. So lots of things that we've done to build uh, have now started to, to pay dividends, and especially if you want to move on to the next um, slide, um, really on the, the lessons learned. So I've in, you know, incorporated some of the stuff that we've I've just mentioned, and this fed a lot of the um, uh, the work in terms of how the new DHEP detective uh, route has been designed. So we, we take a lot of that learning and we're in a much better place now than we ever were. And there are going to be a constant uh, feature of the Met's recruitment, but what we'll do is we'll manage the levels so we get the experience levels right, because our internal programs are, are now delivering more internally so we can balance it well. Thanks, Steve. Great. Thanks, Steve. And I think we'll finish there. So um, apologies for, for running over. You're on mute, Ben. Someone had to do it and it had to be me. Um, thanks, gentlemen. Um, excellent stuff. I was going to ask a point of clarification that someone had posted in the Q&A, but I can see that's already been answered by an audience member, which is great when audience members do our work for us. Um, so we'll move on to the, the last uh, presentation, um, which is from uh, Josie Bullock from University College London. And she's, I guess, bro we're broadening out the discussion slightly now. Um, to move away from, from direct directory uh, detectives specifically to, to the broader issue of police training. And Jyoti is going to be talking to the topic of uh, police readiness to adopt blended learning approaches to learning and development. So Jyoti, over to you. Thank you, Ben. Can you see my screen? I can indeed. Okay, thank you. Um, so yes, um, moving on from the very specific uh, direct entry route to detective uh, constables, and that was 
really interesting presentation. We're moving on to talking about blended learning more generally in terms of the role it might play um, in the years to come in police education. So this was a project that was funded by the National Police Chiefs Council um, in September last year. And uh, it was as part of the overall project to assist the execution of the uplift program. So the new 20,000 police constables given COVID, given the fact that lockdowns were in place, um, it became increasingly difficult um, for police forces to try and um, deliver the training that they were already involved in for the officers that they had recruited. So, um, so this project was to, to sort of assist the evidence base on how blended learning might play a role in police training and education. Our research questions were threefold. We, um, so, so the intention was to try and see um, what does the evidence tell us about blended learning and how that influences learning and development. Um, for this, we conducted a rapid evidence assessment of the literature on blended learning programs. Um, um, we started off with 4,500 studies and we ended up doing a um, synthesis of 42 studies, which included 10 systematic reviews. The second part of this project was to look at or try to learn lessons from other professions that have already um, adopted blended learning approaches to their professional training and whether that uh, whether some of those lessons can be applied to um, police training and education. And the third uh, research question we had was all of this is all very well, but is there appetite and capacity in police forces currently to deliver blended learning? And this is what I'm going to be talking about or focusing on in this presentation. So the method to, uh, that we adopted in trying to answer the question, what do we know about the current state of blended learning um, capability in police forces and are they willing to take this up or is it merely a temporary stopgap solution uh, while the pandemic poses restrictions on how training is delivered. So the question was, what is the existing willingness and capacity in forces to invest in blended learning? And uh, we conducted 14 interviews with uh, L&D leads representing 17 police forces in England and Wales. So the results were one of the first questions we asked was, what do you understand by virtual learning or blended learning? And we got a range of definitions, which indicated a basic problem that there isn't a shared understanding of what blended learning actually means. So it, we've kind of proposed that of all the various elements of blended learning, which uh, includes some amount of face-to-face -face classroom training in person, and some amount of e-learning. Now, if this e-learning or digital learning can either be synchronous, so a classroom session via Zoom, or it could be asynchronous where material is uploaded and candidates can look at that material in their own time. Even in the face-to-face -face training, it, there are again different, uh, different, um, different tools and techniques. It doesn't have to be a lecturer standing in front of a classroom. It can be role play, it can be group work, it can be um, a, a number of different scenarios, case studies. Uh, it can be a number of different tools and techniques, all of which together make up blended learning. So I think one of the first, first findings was, was there needs to be shared understanding of what blended learning actually means. The second finding was um, a number of these forces, uh, so, so they differed in their capability for de delivering blended learning. So some had absolutely no, amount, no uh, digital content in their training programs. And this refers to training both for uh, as part of the PEQF or apprenticeship training, as well as continued professional development. So we were talking about training across the board. Um, and, and some forces said they had very little training before COVID. Um, some said they had to 
overnight transform what they were currently delivering in the classroom online. And that meant a scramble, a scramble that we'll talk about in a minute, how forces had to cope with this sudden, uh, or these sudden demands in them. And there were some forces that had already uh, were well on their path for uh, bringing in blended learning in their training programs. When asked why they were in favor of or why they supported blended learning, uh, participants had a number of different uh, or put forward a number of different justifications. Um, the most important one was as a result of COVID, they had no other choice but to go uh, online and they were trying to combine some amount of face-to-face -face training with online training. It was also considered to be very, uh, uh, was supposed to be cost saving because uh, it just meant people didn't have to travel uh, and go to the training centers, especially for, for professional development um, courses. It also meant you could, you could have a much larger audience and, and, and deliver that training uh, to a much wider um, cohort. It was considered to be uh, the way forward. It was modern. It was bringing in new technology and, and police forces like new and shiny things. So there was uh, some sort of uh, sort of wanted, some forces wanted to be known as, as being more modern. And so they were more keen to bring in blended learning methods. Um, as a result of uh, PEQF, a number of forces were already working with uh, higher education institutions, uh, which had the capacity and were delivering a lot of their training material online. And so learning from uh, these HEIs in partnerships, a number of uh, police forces saw the advantages involved in delivering um, blended learning. And finally, it was also considered to be really flexible, a flexible mode people, the, the, the trainer could record the lecture in, in their own time and put it up. The learner could access that and study in their own time. So it, it gave a lot more flexibility to delivering training. In terms of how trainers and trainees viewed, um, um, viewed the move to blended learning, and this again, remember, is, is, the, is the opinion or perceptions of L&D leads. According to them, uh, the, 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 the reaction of the trainers was mixed, 50-50. There were 50% who were really keen, really enthusiastic, uh, really willing to learn and adopt these new techniques. And then there were the old timers who were uh, convinced that police training could only be done face-to-face -face and were quite resistant, um, either because they were um, unfamiliar with the technology or they were unwilling to learn. Uh, new methods. Trainees, on the other hand, the, the, the initial reaction that uh, forces were getting from trainees seemed to suggest that they were far more, they, they were far more favorable in their attitudes towards uh, blended learning. The only concern they had was they felt quite isolated. They, and this was again, recruit trainees, they felt isolated. They felt they did not get um, to learn from their peers, to learn from their um, colleagues and, and more senior officers. And that is an issue that we will talk about um, in, in the challenges to blended learning going forward. L&D leads also realized that they needed specialists. Now, it wasn't just training specialists, but domain specialists. So people who knew what they were, the, the content of what they were supposed to teach. They needed to have uh, specialists who could design training. It's not just a matter of willy-nilly putting in some uh, content online and other content being delivered face-to-face, uh, -face, but thinking carefully about how the two should blend together so that the synergies can enhance training and learning outcomes. Pedagogy, again, you needed experts who, who understood what aspects of that content should be delivered online, which aspects of that content would be best delivered in person. And finally, you needed IT specialists who, were, uh, who would have the capacity to put this all together um, and deliver uh, the, the, the 
end product uh, with the available technology. So you needed four kinds of expertise coming in if programs had to be designed deliberately to, uh, to be blended in, in their nature. Challenges ahead. So a number of challenges were identified by LND specialists going forward. Um, the first and foremost was technology. All forces were at very different levels in terms of the technology that they possessed and their capacity to get the requisite technology. So while some forces were very easily able to uh, move or their training online, they had the, the, the computers, the, the virtual learning environments. Others were uh, uh, far more um, sort of behind in their journey. And so they didn't have enough, um, enough bandwidth capacity. There weren't enough um, computers, both for the trainers and trainees. And there was this huge scramble to try and figure out. Also, um, digital training and face-to-face -face training online can only work if the technology supports it. And, and uh, L&D leads were quite aware of the problems that might lie ahead. The second challenge was upskilling of staff and students. So while um, there is a general perception that um, new recruits would be young, uh, would be young students, they'd be really comfortable with the digital environment. Um, while that might be true, they might know how to navigate their way around social media. It may not quite be true on how they should be studying using this digital medium and combining it with face-to-face -face training. So there needs to be upskilling, not just of the staff who will design and deliver blended learning, but also students so that to enable them to become more um, self-efficacious, to have the confidence to, to, to take charge of their own learning. And that requires some preparatory upskilling of, of both students and trainers. The third challenge, uh, which a lot of l and um, uh, practitioners talked about was continued support of chief officers. Unless the chief officer team supported a blended learning approach, they were worried that it wouldn't be financed, it wouldn't be able to get the requisite organizational buy-in that is required for it to be successful. So they, they, they realized that it couldn't be something that was half-hearted. Um, it needed to be well thought out and well supported um, on principal grounds. The fourth challenge was cost. Although it was considered that blended learning in the long run might, might be cost um, effective, uh, once you record training, it can be rolled out several times. On the other hand, the upfront cost can be quite significant, both the technology and upskilling, but also blended learning doesn't mean just putting up everything online and letting the student get on with it. It would require a lot of support with tutors and trainers, giving that one-to-one -one support, even if it is online, to students to ensure that their learning is progressing as it should. So it's not quite as cost, cost efficient as one would think because that support is required to maintain and support learning of, of the trainees. The fifth and final challenge that they talked about was socialization into police culture. This they were referring mainly to recruit police officers if a lot of their training, especially the early part of their training would be um, uh, with, with recruits sat in their uh, homes trying to access learning then, then they were a bit worried about socialization into police culture. We talk a lot about police culture being the, the the mother of all evils, but it has a very, very important role that it plays. And that, that aspect of police culture, which is essential knowledge to, to, to operate as a police officer might be lost because a lot of the training moves online. The final, um, the final issue is structural. Um, so it's, it's, it's a question of, um, while, while the first two presentations talked about the importance of protected learning time, um, learning while uh, uh, an apprenticeship, uh, while an apprentice or learning on the job may not actually play out the way you expect it if this 
protected learning time does not remain sacrosanct. So if there's an emergency, you can well imagine that, that people will be pulled out um, to be uh, in the field if there is uh, any kind of emergency. So, so there was a bit of worry about whether protected learning time might actually um, be what it is meant to be. So the take home messages from the overall research. So all three parts of the research showed that it's really important to have a well-designed blended learning program. So the, the literature showed and our interviews with other, other professions showed that unless the, the, the training content is well-designed and delivered, uh, just poor training, just because you move it online won't suddenly become enhanced or, or more um, effective. So you need to design blended learning effectively. It also must be customized to suit both learner types and the type of content to be delivered. So there is some kind of content that is best delivered online. It could be asynchronous for people to do in their own time, but it's, it's the integration of theory with practice that might require a lot more support in person. So it needs to suit the type of learner but also the kind of content that has been delivered. It's really important that learning is scaffolded by both upskilling and developing learner autonomy. If a lot of responsibility is being given to the learner to take charge of their own learning, then they need to have the support to be able to do so. This support uh, for the entire blended learning project needs to come from the senior leadership team. As we've said, chief officer support becomes really important for this um, national agenda for moving on to more blended learning. Going forward, I would think um, uh, for all the evaluations that might be done for whether blended learning actually works, you need a theory of change. Um, you not only need outcome evaluations, but you need process evaluations to understand what works for whom and how. Um, we, we've kind of come up with a very, very um, sort of basic theory of change, which, which could be different for different forces based on what interim outcomes each force wants to achieve. So it forces police organizations to sit and think about why am I adopting blended learning? How do I think what resources would I need to bring to make it successful? And what outcomes am I trying to achieve? And trying to work out the mechanisms by which the inputs will lead to the uh, intended outputs. And ultimately, what is the overall um, impact or final outcomes that you hope to achieve by bringing in improved and more blended learning approaches. Um, our report is available on the, um, on the College of Policing website, um, and I'm happy to uh, answer any questions. If there are. Thank you very much. Thanks, Jesse. Uh, it's, it's fascinating, isn't it? Even when you're talking about what looks like a very niche area, shall we say, the same problems come out that you would have looked at, that you have found in any change programme, even for this. Absolutely. Really interesting. Right, if I could ask all the um, the speakers to turn their cameras and their videos on, we've got uh, we've got plenty of time for questions, which is great because there's quite a few that I would like to ask on behalf of the audience. Of course, I mean, if we, let's start with a big one. A couple of people are saying, uh, and this is primarily aimed at the direct entry detective uh, speakers. Um, that, that you've you painted a, a picture of a re relative success, I think, in both cases. Um, but people are asking why hasn't or well, has that resulted in in a, in a dent in the number of empty detective posts across the country? So has it been successful in that sense? And if it hasn't been, why why might why might be the case? What what might more, what more might need to be done to fill those gaps? Um, I don't know who wants to tell that first. But we'll go to Adrian first if you've got any views on that, and then we'll come to Steve and Steve and Martin second. Um, well, you know, clearly I can only talk about the forces that uh, are, are researching and certainly, well, in one force where the, where the scheme worked well, the answer is yes, it's, it's, it's been a success or, or the force believes it's been a success. And in fact, just over 50% of the detectives now come through, of their, of their whole detective force has come through the, the, the fast track programme. Um, in the other two forces, 
uh, I'd have to be more equivocal, I think, that, um, and, and, and largely it's because of the way that the schemes were, were, were run and operated. Uh, there was a very high attrition from, from, from one scheme, uh, 70%, uh, and in another, about 50%. Uh, and that caused the force to continually con the forces to continually reassess their programs and to change their programs. Whereas in Force A, has been utterly consistent throughout uh, because they, 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 uh, you know you can argue they got it right. Uh, I mean, I, 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 I think that's all we, I can argue for them. Uh, they certainly believe they, they got it right. And, and yes, it has made a dent. They, they they have no vacancies now in that force as it as it stands. Mm. Thanks. Uh, Steve or anyone, do you have any comments? Well, on I can only talk for the Met in terms of, I think we're the only ones for, uh, for a number of years doing the non-uniform pathway. Um, so yes, it's it made a huge difference. Um, but I think as um, Martin pointed out, our numbers, our internal process, we've had to do a lot of work to balance, because what you want is to balance the experience levels. Uh, and we've actually leveled that out now, but our, you know, we do have, we still have vacancies, but they're far less than they, they used to be. But um, just keep an eye on the experience levels. Mm. I think the other point worth making as well is that, that numbers always have to counteract the number of retirements. So um, that's quite important in terms of when you see what the numbers actually are, it's not just about the numbers that are being recruited, it's transferees and retirements that we have, have a to be huge taken. churn, huge mm. churn every month. Retirements, yeah. promotions, you name it. So it's you're you're feeding constantly. So yeah. we're taking fifty four a month. That's a goodness, but that's feeding this this churn all mm. the time. Great, thanks very much. And we had some uh, another kind of set of questions, I guess, on on, on diversity issues. Um, we're starting off with uh, I think both presentations from the direct entry scheme angle talked about success in terms of gender and it was rather mm. more equivocal when it came to, to ethnic minority uh, groups joining the police I think, I think that's right in both cases um, and a linked question there is it, it, well at first is that the case and if so why what, what I guess what more could be done in relation to that is the underlying thrust of that question and, and another question is coming thinking about the kind of the the advent of, of, of Black Lives Matter as, a, as an international movement last year um, and the effect that that may have had on, on recruitment in general and specifically recruitment into the kinds of programs um, you were talking about. Um, so let's start with the, the, the Canterbury crew. Anyone want to comment on those questions first? I, I think I, I was just going to say that uh, I, I did, I thought I did give figures for um, ethnic minority, I think 17 17 percent, uh, which was which was above uh, quite quite a way above the national average. Uh, I think maybe that question was aimed at the first first presentation. Yeah. I, th I, th I think I think um, e even seventeen percent in London is way under. The, mm, yeah, of course, the, of course. The representation. I think it is, is that better than the general recruitment to the Met, or, or about the same level. No, the in terms of ethnic minority, no. I think I, I point out slightly under. So I think when we when, you know when we designed this, we uh, firstly looked at you know making sure that there were no nothing built into the attraction recruitment that was creating attrition uh, and I know you know having worked in our HR teams they spend a lot of time making sure that that's that's right and the day one the whole day one sort of process which the place search is fair I think the 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 second part of the question around the impact the global sort of the Black Lives Matter yeah I mean we've got um, awful lot of work going on uh, across London and across nationally I'm you know, other forces about the impact and links between trusted communities into into recruitment, and that's an ongoing piece of work. Difficult to comment, particularly on the detective program at this time, if I'm honest. Um, and that's probably something that would need to be looked at, I suspect, across a number of pathways. Yeah. I don't know if you want to come in on that, Adrian. Uh, yeah, uh, thanks, Ben. Um, I mean, it's difficult for me to comment on the BLM. Uh, because I've only just come back to the research. It's been 18 months away from the project and just come back to, to it recently. So actually I've kind of missed all, all, all that and I haven't yet had a chance to find out from respondents, you know, the, the, their, their views on the last 12 months or so. Or so. But I mean, certainly in Force A, and I, I, I get I'm almost putting forward Force A as this kind of paragon of, you know, the, the perfection, you know, it's uh, the, certainly um, 
the their recruitment reflected in proportionately reflected that the, the ethnic you know, makeup of the of the area um so they were successful in that regard you know and i say there was that unfortunate incident in force uh, c where they recruited well where they attracted applicants and this is why i said it's really something that they need to think longer and harder about you know should they repeat the uh, the scheme although you know with pqf this it might not even happen that way unfortunately um was that they recruited so, so many it was it was kind of more than they could find places for the national assessment centers and so for somebody to actually get into the police if you like to meet the kind of the baseline standards to get into the police and then in the filtering process then of taking the highest graded number uh, people from that cohort they they lost a lot of the diversity in in the sample uh, in in that cohort, which which kind of you know makes sense on one level, but it actually went against the principles of the scheme in the first place. You know that was something I think that uh, they didn't grasp quick, quickly enough. So I know that you know, I'm confident that um, you know that they would they would be more careful around those issues in, in the future. Right, thank you, Jesse. You've got your hand up, I think. I can ask this question now because it's related or later, if that's okay. You can ask it now. So I had a question for uh, for Adrian. Uh, when you said that uh, a lot of people felt that um, the PEQF and having the police having um, a degree, uh, policing being made a, a profession which needs a degree, uh, reduced the uh, the scope for diversity. I was just wondering. Do, does that really mean, and that's open to everybody, does that really mean that policing as a profession is different from, say, social work or nursing or medicine that requires representativeness more than any of these professions do? Because all of these professions do have a degree requirement for, for, for practitioners there. So I'm just wondering, why do you think, uh, or do you think that the police are are a special or a different organization that need to be far more representative and therefore the requirement that they should have a degree reduces their ability to be representative. It's just a... Thanks for that, Jody. Uh, <laughs> yeah, um, I, I don't know if I believe it, um, but it's what the, my research participants told me. I think that, um, you know, I think there is a kind of role for... Uh, uh, um, I think maybe in policing there's a need for a kind of, uh, uh, I'm trying to think of an appropriate word to say, but kind of rough, rough people to do, to do tough things, you know, sometimes. And I think that uh, you talked earlier about police culture, it's very much a part of police culture. Uh, people in the organisation perceive that. Um, so, I mean, it's not my belief. Uh, um, you know, and if I talked about earlier about my experience as a detective, but I, I joined the police with no qualifications and, uh, and did you know, consecutively a high national certificate, a degree, a master's degree, and then a PhD. So, I, you know, I'm the kind of wrong person maybe to ask about that because I've, you know, absolutely committed to, to the, the higher education and its benefits for, for police officers trying to confront the challenges of the 21st century. But, it's a, but it was a common perception. In fact, no counter argument was put to me from anybody that I interviewed. Uh, or have interviewed in the second phase even uh, of the research. That's really interesting. Um, uh, Jess, I've actually got a question for you. Um, well, it's a statement, but I think it's also a question. Um, and it, it says, having reduced or eliminated formal face-to-face -face training schools slash environments um, on cost basis, and I guess because COVID, for COVID reasons as well, um, I mean, does have forces got the structures in place sufficiently to take up the slack? Um, with blended learning and other approaches? I think that's the thrust of the question. It's absolutely a, a valid question and it's so different across police forces. So there are there are forces that are really committed to training and, and learning and development and they have, they have tried to make uh, resources available, but there are other forces that, that in any case had a, had a fairly shortcut approach towards training. So instead of the 20 weeks, they have just 10 weeks in the school and, and off on the streets. But those forces, it's, it's, it's just how much a force and its learning and development uh, uh, sort of unit and the senior leadership believe training is important and, and resources will flow. If, if the senior leadership thinks training is just something we've got to tick a box for, let them learn on the streets, then 
whether you have training schools or whether you have uh, blended learning, it's not going to work. That's just that. Again, that's that for a minute, doesn't I it? just add a point to that, Ben. Yeah, sure. Um, I mean, one of the things I would say is when you look at all the police research that's been conducted over the years, so little has been done on police training. I mean, there's the Sarah Charman who did her research recently um, and obviously Jennifer Brown that um, Adrian referred to earlier. And in detective work, it was, it's, it's literally been either a PhD or two, Adrian's research that he's talking about or the research that the MPS funded for us to do. And it just seems that you know, that's so important research. When you kind of think of all policing reviews, they always talk about uh, a training recommendation, but so little is dedicated to um, research and police training. And when you try and get the, the funding from other sources, they expect the police to fund it. And the police really don't have those funds. It's very difficult for them to get hold of it. So, um, mm -hmm. you know, we were really fortunate to, to have the access we had. Um, you know, I saw one of the questions asking about sample sizes and things like that. Um, and one of the things we were trying to do is uh, is focus on um, a couple of cohorts in quite a bit of depth. Um, I think someone said, uh, you know, 88 officers out of 800. Well, we we're probably looking at it slightly differently. Um, well, that was the total number of officers. Many of them still haven't become substantive because they're still going through the process. So just to give you a few, few, few statistics, so 36, 35 percent of the substantive detectives of DCP we 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 had and then and then the earlier ones in the cohort um for example uh the DCP students in the first cohort was 25 percent of the annual recruitment that year for DCP so we, I think we have to think of those things uh, a little differently um but I think that they're you know Jennifer's research Sarah's research agents research and ours is really important but we need more of it because it's constantly changing different people are joining what's their motivation where they're coming from and how effective are they I mean as, as Jyoti was saying you know different people need different things in the training process and we need to understand that better so um you know it's the unfortunate thing that in, unless research councils can, can provide more money for those kinds of things it's going to be very difficult to develop that area of knowledge yeah Absolutely. Um, and picking up on a couple of things you said there, a couple of people were asking about uh, attrition in general. I think I think they wanted a bit of clarification from, from both the, the director entry uh, presentations on, on what attrition looked like and how it played out within these cohorts. Steve, I don't know if you want to pick that up now before I go on, go back to Adrian. Yeah, I mean, I, 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 the figures that I gave were, were of the DCP was just under 10% um, of that thousands and 67 and then that equated to a equivalent of about 6.9 percent for the uniform uh, cohort which have, which is a much larger cohort but proportionally well you know and actually we thought we would that we weren't overly um, affected by it because we expect attrition the early cohorts we saw a larger attrition in the first year and actually over the last three years that's tailed off which I hope is representing the fact that we've started to get that support structure right but simply for some, it wasn't the right job because if hadn't researched the job enough, perhaps didn't really realise what it was about. So I'm not overly concerned that, that the attrition rates are probably where we think they should be. But they are now, certainly less now. Yeah. And just to be just to be clear, what, what do you mean by attrition in this context? So this is this is either this is leaving the service. So either, well, it's going to be resigning, but for a whole host of reasons. And people resigned over personal reasons for it. Uh, just wasn't the job for them. A whole host of uh of things the occasional misconduct as well but not not too much of that um but uh, but generally it's got better over the years over the last three years which i think is a good sign thanks very much adrian did you want to touch on anything to uh well, very different experiences in the three forces uh, again in force a very low single figures um and in in one case one person left us left the, the, the service completely and one transferred to another force uh in the other two forces relatively high hiring hiring force C then force B um, and, and that was because they they had a policy uh, um, um, which was that if you left the scheme you left the, left the force whereas the other force decided that if you left the scheme you could still remain a uniform cop um, and it you know it led to I mean I don't know which was the best policy to be honest I think you know you could argue for both but certainly in in in, in the one force you had people deliberately failing the NIE so they would be kept in uniform but then finding themselves sacked you know kind of it, it all got very messy and I think that all went back to the kind of the way that the scheme was set up the quality of 
the, uh, of the selection process and the quality of the training that was delivered, um, you know, it's very difficult, very difficult rather, to, to to unpick those things. I think they're all connected. Great, thank you. I didn't mention um, Ben was that some some laterally transferred to uniform role, small number, uh, as well. So you know there is movement, and when we recruit now, um, everyone has to pass the standard recruitment for becoming a PC. If they don't pass the detective assessments, we offer them a PC role and many take it up. So, you know, the motivations I suppose to join are, you know, if the opportunities there, I'll take it. If not, I'll join them in the traditional way. So it's quite interesting, different motivations. Great, thank you. And, and another question here, and this is actually something I wanted to ask Adrian, but I think it's right at the beginning, but I think it applies to everyone really. Um, and it, it's a question about what more could be done to make up this shortfall. So, so obviously other things are going on to try and make up the shortfall of detectives other than the kind of things we've been talking to today. So the, so the question is asking, why can't detective shift patterns or pay or allowances or other things be changed to, to, to address the shortfall and, and get more people in and keep them in while they're there? Um, and the question I wanted to ask is, is, you know, if I put on my naive hat, which isn't very difficult for me, um, I, I would have assumed that this would be the sexiest role in policing and people would love to do, be detectives because that's what they think police officers do. Um, so it, I, I would have thought it's quite surprising to many people that you can't find enough detectives to, to fill these roles. Yeah, I think, well, I think it is, you know, I, I think Steve and Martin talked to you about the kind of shift that's taken place of, over the years and, and, and there's still this kind of fictional representation of detective work as the kind of sexy side of policing, if you like. Um, but but the, the reality is, I say, because officers, well, pay and allow, pay, uh, allowances particularly have been cut over the years, so detectives don't get the same allowances they used to get. And there's a whole kind of, um, you know, the environment that they're working in is, is one where the kind of, the case kind of dictates their working hours in a way that it doesn't, when you're in uniform, you come on and you work your shift and you go home again. And um, sure, when you come back to work the next day, there's a, there's a whole lot more work to do, but it's not what you were doing yesterday and it's somebody else has dealt with that. Which is, you know, completely opposite to being a detective officer. You do have that great, great responsibility, and that's, a, you know, it can be a heavy burden, particularly when you've got childcare responsibilities or, you know, a complicated family, you know, family life as many of us have. Um, you know, it's kind of, um, you, you, it's difficult to separate out your professional and personal life. I think for for, for detective often, um, and you know, conversely, more has been done to. Um, ease, ease, you know, ease the burden on, on on uniform staff in terms of shift patterns. You know, some some forces. You know, the last uh, job that I had in the police, my, my uniform closed in four days on, four days off. You know, it gives you time to recharge your batteries before you go back. You know, doing twelve hour shifts or ten hour shifts. I think uh, go back again. You know, and of course, as a detective, um, with um, the kind of commitments detectives have in terms of court cases and various other tribunals they're involved in and just working in the office, you know, that, that, that option isn't available. So what you can see that this has been a steady kind of, um, you know, it's been death by a thousand cuts of the CID. I think it's not, it's not, it's hard to point to one, one factor, but altogether, I think it's meant that it's become much less attractive a, 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 a job than it, than it once was. Mm. Mm. Thanks. And, and are there other things being done to try and maintain keep up numbers of I mean there must be other well, one that, I mean I, I know that um, I went to several meetings of working groups when I was conducting research where people you know at the very senior level were talking about uh, detective welfare and things like um, and I don't know Steve uh, claiming might be able to say more on this but the, the consideration of a, a staff bank where recently retired cops could be brought back as mentors to help the you know the the, the 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 new trainees coming through on the on these programs so there was that kind of uh, uh, um, as well you know extra so extra sub, not just emotional moral support but actual real you know practical support uh, available so i know that i know that um lots of people are taking it very seriously and working hard to you know to 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 improve the situation that we've described um but i just it's it's an it, i won't say the problem is intractable but it's a very very difficult challenge that they're facing and i don't underestimate that Great, thanks. I think we've got time for just one more question. Um, and this is actually, I mean, this could apply to any of you actually, any of the presentations. And this is about the selection process and, and role criteria of the trainers um, and coaches involved in this kind of processes. So how, how do you get those individuals in and, 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 and are perceived shortcomings um, on, the, on their part by the people going through these various training programs, are they important and what do they look like? 
quite a big question for the last one, isn't it? Anyone wants yeah. to <laughs> <laughs> I, can, I, I, to <laughs> I can talk about the coaches. So we, you know, we actively look at, um, as uh, detectives come to the end of their service, then we'll try and say, look, do you want to become a coach? Because it's a police staff role. So, but we want, they have to be put to accredited and maintain that accreditation. So, you know, and, you know, I remember when we brought the coaches in, we were asking, testing their thoughts on the, on the, the new routes. What do they think of it? And some of them were really positive. Some of them weren't quite so sure, which, which is fine, provided they're there to support and, and develop. And they offer some fantastic insights what you've got to do is make sure that they're fully versed in how boroughs operate now because some were working in specialized areas hadn't worked on a borough based role for some time and if i look at the volume of work my colleagues do my the dcs i work for my boroughs they do an amazing amount this really high i think they underestimate how highly skilled they are but they have a high they do have a high workload and what they need is someone to offload to help support particularly in the early stages with workbooks, get a bit of a sense of how you manage a workload, how you deal with risk, which is in essence what, you know, good detective will look and flag and deal with risk. So I can't, you know, the, the support that coaches give and colleagues who can act as coaches is, is absolutely central and sort of builds into the question before about what can you do to support and encourage people to be detectives? And they need to see they're going to be supported. Uh, if they don't, they won't join the, 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 the CID. So there's, there's quite a bit going on and well-being is much more front and centre than it used to be. Jesse. So, um, so one of the things that was really interesting is, is when we talk about trainers and, and if, I, if I just keep it to blended learning, it's, it's a lot of it was about what did, the, what did the learners want, but there was, and there needs to be more attention paid to what do the trainers want to, what do they have, um, skills in. So there are some people who are really good at delivering face-to-face -face and they, they, get, they get a sense of um, sort of what they can deliver face-to-face -face they can't do online and there are others who prefer to use online deliveries but for very little choice is given to people. People are, are just told you've got to do it this way whether you have the skill or the liking or even the ability to deliver in particular ways. So the way I mean, one of, the, one of the reasons why there is a national movement towards moving towards blended learning is because people are dissatisfied with training as it is currently being delivered. But unless you upskill trainers, just moving the medium through which you're training will not improve training. And, and that needs to be understood by forces that it's not just a, a question of, oh, we've got a trainer, make this person do whatever is the latest fashion or the diktat of senior leadership teams. It needs the adequate support and also needs to play to the requirements and talents of the trainer, which rarely gets picked up and given importance in, in police forces. So if you want good training, you've got to keep both the learners and the trainers happy. And Martin, I'll give the last word to you. I think you've got your hand up. Yeah, I'm sorry, sorry but just a quick way. I, I mean, I agree wholeheartedly with that. But I think one of the things that's really crucial is, uh, um, and I'm probably not going to be uh, popular here, but is that, you know, I think experience and knowledge as a detective takes you so far. Uh, and it's very important to try to uh, capture that experience to be able to teach young trainees. But I think there needs to be a, a, a consistent approach to that, which includes proper development of people to be trainers uh, on top of their experience and knowledge and the same with mentors uh, yes you will get some that are naturally capable of doing that without any training uh, there, there are sort of inherent dangers in just allowing experience to talk and to teach and to mentor on its own yeah that's been really interesting yeah a great place to finish um, thanks ever so much to all the speakers. That was really, really interesting. Um, to, to everyone attending, thanks very much for attending. Um, keep an eye out for the next announcement of our, our seminar series, which will be kicking off again in the autumn. So I expect to um, hear more about that in due course. Um, thanks very much for coming along today.